right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Roseanne Campana, Campana Hodge, who is in Connecticut, just outside New York. How are you doing, Roseanne? I'm doing fantastic. Excellent. And, and Dr. Roseanne is a trailblazing psychologist with over 30 years pediatric mental health expert and founder and director of the Global Institute of Children's Mental Health and Dr. Rose, Roseanne and Associates. And what we want to talk today about is, so working from, working from home, um, you know, having your kids at home, adjusting to a whole new virtual world, that can be quite stressful for people, uh, particularly if they've never done it before, particularly if their environment isn't really set up for it. Um, so I wanted to talk today about how do you manage working from home and manage your mental well-being and your mental well-being of those who happen to share that environment with you, whether it's roommates or children or spouses or whatever. Um, so, Dr. Roseanne, since this pandemic has started and so many people have been dumped into a virtual world that maybe they're unprepared, unprepared for, what are some of the challenges, particularly from a mental health and stress related point of view, have you seen that people are having to deal with? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that we were already at a very high stress point walking into this pandemic, John, you know, yeah. both children, adult, you know, across every age. Um, but certainly the pandemic has, is an exacerbator, the isolation, the the stress, the overwhelm, these are the things that people are experiencing. And some people are experiencing clinical symptoms for the first time in their life. Mm. I would say what I'm seeing most predominantly from people that are working and educating their kids from home absolutely is a feeling of overwhelm. People are feeling socially isolated and um, people are feeling struggling with focus, multitasking, and lots and lots as we're into 2021, everybody wants to talk to me about brain fog and that mm. they're just very worn out and they're having a hard time and their performance levels are going down, whether it's, you know, connecting with their kids or doing their work or helping their kids with their schoolwork, <laughs> people are struggling. And is, is part of that because uh, maybe maybe a lot of people's lives were kind of spread out, even compartmentalized in the past or whatever. And now it's all being brought together within almost with, you know, within a physical, physical constraints and greater proximity to people, maybe spending more time, maybe having to um, negotiate for space and time to be able to do work properly. How, how much of it has got to do with the, if you like, the uncompartmentalizing of your life. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with the uh, lack of structure and routine. And, mm -hmm. you know, nobody was equipped to be a teacher <laughs> right. for their kids. I mean, teachers have to go to school and get at least a four-year degree for that. So now they're doing that. And, and education across America looks like the Wild West. So some kids are doing a lot of learning. Some kids, yeah. it's a 30-minute check-in and the parents are expected to monitor their kids homework and teach them, um, you know, who wants to do algebra? I mean, somebody wants to talk to me about algebra, that's stressful. So structure and routine, a lack of physical exercise, John, you know, people mm -hmm. like myself uh, went to the gym before they went to work. Um, I'm committed to exercising, so I'm still doing it, but it's, there's a lot of differences and, and now it's the winter and, in you know, half of America experiences some pretty some cold and people are much more sedentary in general. Um, so I think those are the factors and, and isolation. I think isolation mm -hmm. is playing a huge part in people having a hard time. I mean, who doesn't miss going out with their friends? No, no, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think what you just outlined there is there's a couple of really interesting part, really interesting parts to it. I, I would say this here's an interesting one from when the pandemic first first started. Uh, you know, I go out running sometimes at lunchtime or we go walking or whatever, and we've done, you know, do that. And when the pandemic first started, oh, the streets were here, were packed, people were everywhere. Right? Everybody was out, everybody was out exercise walking. Now we'll go out, meet nobody. It's like the fatigue, as you said, like the fatigue took over and now people aren't even motivated to get up off their, out of their desks at lunchtime. 
the pandemic has usurped people's motivation. I tell you that. Uh, I'm hearing a low motivation from kids, you know, students of all ages and adults. People are like, I'm sick and tired of this. There's no end in sight. And uh, they're binge watching Netflix. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, no, they are. I mean, I think they're binge watching net Netflix and then getting up in the morning like googly eyed or whatever, you know, as you said, brain fog, because they're just looking for so much uh, any form of escapism. So how do you how do you help people remove yeah. that fog from their brain and create some clarity and reduce the stress? Yeah. So there's a couple things is I'm all about action and there's lots mm -hmm. of things we can do. So first of all, uh, you know, we we need self-care. And, you know, self-care is as little as 10 minutes in a day. And that means powering down your nervous system with breath work or meditation or yoga or biofeedback, all accessible, easy things that people can do of all ages. And when we do that, it's restorative and our nervous system isn't as activated, um, which people are very stressed. But we need structure and routine. People need to make sure they are just like they would on a Monday to Friday when they were hopping on the train or driving to work. They need structure and routine. They need a schedule. If they're in, if they have a partner, if they have kids, everybody needs to know what your structure and your, your schedule is. And you need to get up and move. You need exercise every single day. Um, exercise has a multitude of physical benefits. Uh, including lymphatic drainage, heart, you know, getting your heart rate up, sweating, um, detoxifying, but it gets oxygen to the brain and it releases feel good endorphins. And we need that. And I think that really will help people, you know, inoculate themselves to a point with stress, you know, other clinical symptoms, but it is going to really help with your focus, which is really dragging people down more than anything that I'm hearing about right now. Yeah, and I, I I love that point about you know uh, about routine, and developing a routine as difficult as that is sometimes for people. But I think you have to. Um, I think one of the main maybe mental blocks to developing a proper routine is that is that people are still maybe too much focused on well this is temporary and I'm going to get back to somewhere eventually. So I don't want to even go to the bother of doing all of that. And the reality is we don't know what the future really holds. No. And in the meantime. The less focus you have, the more the more stressful things become, and then the 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 knock on impact to your colleagues, um, to your family, to those around you, it can be tremendous. Absolutely, and you know our brain, you know we crave structure and routine, and it frees up mental space when we have predictability, and it allows us to achieve at a higher level and not feel so stressed. Just like kids, right? Kids are very stressed out because they're missing their structure and routine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's important. And, and as, as much as it is to take 10 minutes a day to calm down and move um, are equally as important. And those should be part of your structure and routine every day. Yeah, and, and I think that's an interesting thing because we resist structure and routine, but we crave structure and routine. So it's a, it's a strange dichotomy, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and it really does help performance. You know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. it does. You know, it's the same reason why I'm taking live exercise classes, right? Because I know at this time there's a class and I got to get to it. Even though I can do on demand, I do better knowing there's a time and that I need to be there. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm like that. I mean, I, I do I do martial arts and that, but it's for me, it's always been exercise has been when you have that on your, you know, you have your class, you've got to do this, you've got to go there. It's a great way of getting you to do things. If you just go uh, in the in the good old days, I'll just buy a gym membership and I'll work yeah. out by myself. Yeah, you end up giving them a, a, you end up giving them a nice gift of whatever your annual <laughs> fee is and never showing up. <laughs> So oh, true, John. That's what they're banking on, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly what they're banking on. Exactly, exactly. And then, I mean, one of the other things I think, at, uh, especially when people are working remotely, is is managing the dynamics of their relationships, right? Because yes, as you said, maybe to maybe both parent, maybe both uh, you know adults in the in the household are working, and you have to negotiate times, and you've got kids, and as you said, nobody's trained to be a teacher. Um, how do you? How can people? better communicate with the other people who are involved, whether they like it or not, involved in their working day? Yeah, I think 
first of all, you know, as a therapist, you know, who's, who's been working for 30 years, you know, one of the biggest breakdowns in families is mismatched expectations, right? It's like this in any relationship. One person thinks one thing, another person thinks another, and neither one of you communicate. And what happens is friction, right? And so in a family, you know, parents sometimes think, well, I'm doing something. My kid should just understand that yeah. this is what I want. It doesn't work like that. So a family meeting and really uh, having a family meeting when nobody's angry and structuring it in a time and a place that's best for everybody is the best way to do it. And really just saying, don't ask yes or no questions of your kids. So ask open-ended questions and say, hey, here's the structure. Here's your routine. Give your kids choices. Uh, I'm, I believe in a style of parenting called autonomy supported parenting. I, you know, this is what builds leaders to give kids autonomy and our American culture doesn't want to give kids autonomy. They want to helicopter the heck out of them. Mm -hmm. um, but we want free thinkers, right. Who are dynamic and they do better in lives. And these are our entrepreneurs. So, um, so having a family meeting, clear expectations, open discussion, choices and options, um, are really important and, and it should be ongoing, but, you know, flush out expectations. Your kid will have an expectation. You'll have an expectation and you've got to meet in the middle. And it's important to do that. And these, this is, this is a long time, John, that people will be, you know, I do believe in the 2020, 2022 school year that there will still be hybrid learning at a minimum. So, um, just based on virusology lasting three years, uh, a typical virus. Yeah, and I, and I think as, as we were saying, I think that's part of the issue then is like, um, is that we don't know what's going to happen. You know, we crave for things to go back to the way they were, but the reality is though, is regardless of whether kids can go back to school or not, um, there's a lot of companies who've now discovered the fact that virtual working can work. Can 100% can be more productive. And they're starting to question all the money they're spending on office buildings, on travel, on all of these other things. So you may want to consider the fact that even if everything opened up tomorrow, you may not end up back in your office. No, absolutely. I think employers really need to think about that. And they need to think about nurturing their employees and supporting them working from home, not just saying, oh, here's a computer, see you later, we're meeting yeah. on Zoom on Wednesday. Um, because they need to think about employee mental health, which is, an, you know, American mental health now in the pandemic is an all time low. 70% uh, of all parents, according, according to the APA Stress in America survey in 2020, is significantly impacted by uh, the pandemic and feel overwhelmed. 70%. I mean, no surprise. So these are working people, right? And so, you know, they need to work, they need to be flexible. They need to work on building connection. They need to work on stress management and teaching their, their employees coping skills. They need to work on employee wellness. I think all organizations, school systems, employers are going to be faced with a challenge in the upcoming years. And right now, uh, people struggling with mental mental health issues and high levels of stress more than they ever have. Um, and they're going to have to support them because working for home is not always the choice of employees. And not everybody knows how to put structure in, in, in place and be motivated while working from home. It takes a different kind of person to work from home, right? Um, and it's also isolating. And we're human beings. So the, those pieces that support really retaining great employees, which cost a lot of money to replace, um, but also making sure your employees are doing well m emotionally, because we this is important. And this needs to be part of what organizations are doing more, moving forward, not just schools. Yeah, no, I 100% I, I agree. And I think uh, and I think there's a lot of onus also on, on the companies, to, as you said, you know, to to actually be proactive about this, to just say, okay, um, maybe we're going to have to communicate differently. Another thing I think to take some stress off people is maybe you need to have a dialogue with uh, your, your individual employees and your employees need to have a dialogue with you about what are their circumstances. Because let's 100%. face it, if you've got yeah. a bunch of young kids or whatever, maybe the mornings ain't the best time for you to be able to work. Maybe you have to 
uh, change your working hours to maybe work in the evening. But I think you've got to have those conversations and we've got to be flexible to new models of working. Yeah, we have to, they have to be flexible. Um, you know, I think it was like 1.3 million women left the workforce last year, mm -hmm. right? You know what I mean? So because they had to choose to be home with their kids yeah. and, and maybe they're in positions where they can't be flexible, but I think it, companies need to be flexible right now. It's just what has to happen. No, it, it, it does. And I, and I think that's, um, and I think it's, it's, it's an onus on both. I mean, I think you have to have that, you, you have to raise that issue yourself as an employee as well and say, let's have a conversation about yeah. this. But um, em employers sure. need to be proactive, sure, sure, not great. reactive more than ever. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And they can't just drop in and be like, oh, we have this yoga class today. They've got to provide ongoing support if they're not building the connection by creating that, you know, team that's, in person. I mean, people thrive off that, right? Uh, I can tell you, I'm grateful that my employees, most of my employees still come to work. I mean, we are social beings. We're a bunch of therapists, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Staring, putting, putting the, uh, putting the laptop on the couch and staring at it, I guess is not quite the same. It's not quite the same. <laughs> you're missing the, the, you know, we're a bunch of huggers. So, you know, you're missing, you're just missing connection. You're missing a laugh. You're missing, you know, the body language. You're missing mm -hmm. a lot of things, you know? Yeah. And, and that's why I think it's, it's so incredibly important that these things are addressed. One question I do want to ask you an interesting one is the difference between stress and anxiety, because I think this is a powerful one, because I think a lot of people would sort of confuse them as, or conflate yeah. them, if you like. Yeah. So, you know, stress is a reaction to something that our body perceives as a stressor. So our body knows no difference between good and bad stress. So almost getting in a car accident or the birth of a child, your body sees it the same, right? Um, it also can be something totally irrational and your body sees it as a stressor. So your body reacts, your nervous system activates, you go from a relaxed sympathetic, a parasympathetic state to a sympathetic and your, all your resources in your body almost essentially prepare for war. Your heart rate goes up, your immune system goes there, and then your nervous system goes down. So we go through periods of stress and sometimes it's a one time, sometimes it's repeated, but our nervous system goes back. Anxiety is different. It occurs, it can result from chronic stress that occurs over a long-term time, but Anxiety is when you something is interfering with your daily life, whether it's your work life, your school life, your relationships, you know, social functioning in some way. And it can be worries that interfere with you, um, you know, speaking up at work or asking for support, or maybe you leave a job because of worry. It can be um, a rage. It can be anger. It can be <laughs> that anxiety can look very different and can be very heavily somatic. But the difference between the two is that anxiety interferes with your daily functioning. Mm. Yeah, no, that that's really that that's really interesting, and I think that's fascinating for people to see the difference from that because then you can start to manage it, right? I mean, yeah. you can sort of reduce you know, reduce the stress levels by, you know, in the moment, but then reduce the anxiety by looking at things on a broader level. Yeah. And, you know, there's lots of things we can do with both and, and we need to take time to relax our nervous system every day so that we don't get into this chronic stress state. Cause I can tell you many Americans are uh, in a chronic st stress state, you know, prior to the pandemic, over a million people a day missed work because of stress. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it leads to like 1 trillion lost dollars and for employers in a year. So, um, you know, it's, it's a problem. People are living, Americans in particular are living a very high stress life with n not a lot of downtime. Yeah. And, and to, to be honest, I mean, I think, you know, we, we have to say that on that some of that stress is unnecessarily and self-inflicted by spending too much maybe too much of your time on social media on on news sites and all these things everywhere that's that's designed to provoke reactions in in, in us and we just get sucked into it and we allow it and before you know it, we're angry at the whole world it seems when in reality like if we just push a lot of that aside and focus on what's important and what's in front of us we yeah. would feel better yeah. And, you know, people are shortchanging their sleep. They're eating garbage. Um, they're staying in toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. um, they're not addressing issues. 
that are small um, and to better themselves and not doing things every day. You know, we, we do have to, I take care of myself every day. I, I do uh, neurofeedback, biofeedback or PMF every day and meditate. Um, and you know, it doesn't have to be hours. Yes. I yeah. go for a massage and yes, I, I used to do fun things like go on vacation with my friends every 90 days. Um, but, uh, you know, those, those days are just on hold for a little bit, but it's the daily, it's just taking your care of yourself a little bit every day and sleep. I couldn't tell you is just so pivotal for mental health. It really is. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, I think as, as we said earlier, like staying up binge watching Netflix and going to bed at like, you know, 2am in the morning and then not being able to sleep because your head is full of all this stuff and then being on your phone, it's not a good combination at all. It's not a good combination. Yeah. And so I think the, the reality, if, if you sum up everything that we've been talking about, is there are simple steps that can be taken both on the individual side and on the company side to help with uh, with this, uh, with, with virtual working, to help with re- stress and, and anxiety reduction. And I think underlining it all is, number one, recognizing the, that there is a problem and also making sure that you figure out how to communicate with people in a way that that works for them because we all receive information differently. We do all receive information differently. And, you know, I do think, you know, on, on the employee and the employer side, start the conversation, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, at, as an employer, you know, offer support and continued support, they're going to have to offer support to retain employees in the upcoming months and years. And on the employee side, if you have a concern, you know, speak up in a way that isn't, you know, sometimes people are so stressed, they may not speak in a way that it may be overly emotional, right? So, how, Mm -hmm. you know, think about it. If it's too emotional for you, formulate it in an email and then, you know, talk to the right people at work. But people can do things for themselves and it can just be as simple as breath work every day Mm. and it will make a difference. And go to bed, stop stop binge watching and eat healthier foods. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So stop binge watching, eat healthier foods, make sure- And exercise. Exercise, (laughs) exercise. like don't just lock yourself away. I mean, when when, if you're having your lunch break, don't let your lunch break be, you know, YouTube. Don't be sitting on your devices at your lunch break. Get up and move. Yeah, exactly. It makes a big difference, you know? Exactly, it it does. does. And maybe get one of those apps, like, you know, that's like Strava or something, and that's the only thing you use at lunchtime, and that'll track how far you walk or how far you run and everything. It's kind of fun to see your um to set yourself some goals and to see your achievements and, and that's sort all of mm-hmm. yeah people are using aura the ring yeah you know so that's a gives you gives you your sleep and your your exercise it's really cool yeah so i mean there's not so i mean you can turn this around and turn it into something that's actually very you know very positive and and, and uplifting and it's as 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 uh as Roseanne said, is like, have those conversations, have those conversations with your employers, have those conversations with those who surround you. And, and to be honest, have a conversation with yourself. Have a conversation. It all starts with you. Mm-hmm. It all starts from within. And we have so much power to change our thinking and, and you know, uh, you know, being kind to ourselves and, and, you know, saying good things to ourselves instead of being so critical, which is what adults do a lot, can be really, really a game changer. Little things, mm-hmm. little changes create big waves. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's a great way to, to finish here today is a little change. Because sometimes you think, I mean, people say, oh, my goodness, I just listened to this. Okay, so. I got to immediately set a conversation with my boss. I've got to start an exercise routine. I got to go, no, baby steps, baby steps. Baby steps. Start with one one thing thing. and just do it. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, uh, Dr. Roseanne, this has been fantastic. All of Dr. Roseanne's information is going to be below this video. But uh, before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. Yeah. So, um, you know, I am a psychologist who's on a mission to change the way we view and treat mental health. Um, And I have been using integrative natural therapies for almost 30 years. Um, And I've had the privilege of helping thousands of people. I'm on the, I'm the founder of the Global Institute of Children's Mental Health, and I work with individuals and corporations um, and people, people can, you know, you can find me on the links below. Um, but I am grateful to be doing what I'm doing and really trying to help people to make those little changes because they really, really do make a difference. 
Yeah, listen, it's fantastic. And I really would encourage people to check out uh, Dr. Roseanne's work and her books. Uh, she's got a fantastic book on uh, um, for how to how to deal with children. And, and that's a great, great, obviously big issue now. Um, you're probably seeing more of your kids than you ever imagined you would. Some of us think that's fantastic. Some other people, maybe not so much, but hey. Um, you can turn it to your advantage. Listen again, thank you, Dr. Roseanne. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.